Hello, everyone, and welcome to another I Work in Sport live interview. That's the show where we uh, talk to accomplished sport business professionals who come here to share with you the knowledge, experience, tips, and advice in order to help you succeed in your career. Today, I have a very, very special guest, but before I get to him, let me introduce myself. My name is João Frigerio, if, um, the founder of I Work in Sport. Uh, if you don't know, uh, the company I Work in Sport connects talents and recruiters in the industry, uh, especially, but not only, through a series of events, in-person and online events, while we also promote career growth and education, always in sport. Um, check us out on uh, iworkinsport.com. You can there uh, at the, on the website, iworkinsport.com, or in our social media channels. You can find us pretty much everywhere um, at I Work in Sport. Um, thank you again for being here today. If you're coming back, you know the drill. Uh, please say hello. Don't be shy. Uh, leave a comment. Uh, we would like to know where you're watching from. We normally have a very international crowd. Uh, it would be great as well if you uh, can give us that uh, like uh, if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, also subscribe to the channel if you like that uh, type of content. And uh, yeah, and don't forget to hit that bell icon as well to get notifications for uh, future videos. Now, let me quickly introduce my guest. It's a great, a very dear friend of mine uh, whom I met through the FIFA Master alumni. He did one year before uh, me. He is uh, constantly published by uh, the most important newspapers in Brazil, Estado, Globo, Folha, Lance, and so many other international outlets. I'm talking about Pedro Trengraus, uh, a lawyer who started his uh, to work in, in uh, professional football still while at um, university, and uh, as also business consultant, kind of does uh, both things and he'll explain more about uh, that to us. He has advised you know, organizations such as Coca-Cola, Ambev, uh, the uh, Sao Paulo State Football Federation, and even the United Nations. Uh, he is also the coordinator for the FIFA CIS executive program, which is taught in partnership with the Fundação Getúlio Vargas, the FGV in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, well, if I were to give his full CV, we would take the, the whole time of, of the show. So instead of that, I'm actually going to invite him and let him uh, give more uh, uh, of uh, you know, a summary of his career. And we're going to start a very nice conversation. So let me bring him in. Hello, Pedro. How are you? Hello, João. Uh, many thanks for inviting me. And as we have a global audience, it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thank you, João. That's right, that's right, Pedro. I think we're going to have a, a big crowd from, well, at least a decent crowd uh, from Brazil. Let me just uh, start to give, saying hello to some people who are leaving messages here. Some we know, Bruno Leone is in Sao Paulo. Uh, there is JH27, hello from Manchester. Erica, how are you? Here in Lausanne, in the next room. <laughs> Omeo, she's um, normally sees us from, from India. Guilherme Fernandes, also from Brazil. Yuri, it's great to have uh, you guys with us. Prepare your questions. Uh, Pedro has, you know, great stories and a lot of knowledge to share. Pedro. I think the a good way for us to, to start, I said that if I was to give your CV, I would take a um, very long time. You know it's uh, by heart and maybe you can give us uh, some highlights. So tell us um, about your career in sport in particular. I mentioned that you started, well, you studied law. Um, and from there, still at university, started working with sport. So tell us about your journey. Well, my journey is at the beginning yet, and the best is yet to come, John. Uh, the biggest challenge is always the next one. And 
what I can tell you, and I believe that it's important for everybody watching us, is that sometimes uh, everything happens by chance and you must take, uh, make the most out of it. I, I, I went to study law and never thought of working in sports. Uh, at the university, I enrolled in a short course of sports law. The teacher, the professor, was the president of the Football Federation of Rio de Janeiro. And it changed my life because he invited me to join the, the board of the Football Federation. And uh, I did it in 1999. And I have been working with sports ever since. So it was something that happened and it was not, it was not planned uh, whatsoever. And, and that's, that's how I started working in sports. And from the Football Federation of Rio, I went to the FIFA Master, which was a watershed as well in my life and my career, very important. Uh, we, we have in sports, very few people really sports because people learn in practice. Uh, these courses are, are rather new. I mean, even the FIFA Master, we are 20 years old right now. Uh, I think less than 1,000 people have graduated at the FIFA Master. If you look at the sports industry worldwide, I dare to say that the majority of executives and, 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 and practitioners, they have not graduated to work there specifically. So when we, when we seek this, this path uh, through schools and, 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 and courses, we qualify our practice much, much more. And, and I mean, it's, it's a, an ongoing process. And that's what I did. I went to study and, and I work on things that I have studied. I'm not just Captain Jack Sparrow that goes along doing things. So I prepared, I studied, I reflected, and, and I, I, it, it's, it makes a, a huge difference in the market, especially when you deal with people that uh, do not have the same background, academic background, that you have in these in these questions. Let's see, John. But it's, it's a, tell us a, a little bit more about since you graduated from the FIFA Master. So that was back in 2004. I got to know you shortly after that because I did one year after you, and uh, the alumni association brought us together, and uh, we met a few times. I can't remember exactly how, but we became friends and then close friends. Um, but then you go back to Brazil and then tell me uh, what you did for work. You did go back to the, to the Federation for, for, a, for a while, then you decided to run your own business. You have uh, a law firm. I came, I came back because I was committed to the Brazilian Football uh, Confederation and the Football Federation of Rio. They helped me with the the costs of the FIFA master. So I came back to work with them for a while. And then I went to work at Bahia, a state of Brazil, as the general secretary of the Football Federation of Bahia. And it was very interesting because I couldn't imagine that I would, I would see in, in, in 2005 uh, a, a professional football championship uh, being broadcasted for free, the TV at Bahia, I mean, uh, it's not so long ago, they, they, they were displaying the matches, saying that they were doing a favor to, to the football clubs. They, they, they did not have to pay for broadcasting. They did not have to buy the rights. They were saying, oh, just by putting you on TV and giving you exposure, and then you can sell sponsorships. Then, I, I mean, it was... Maybe back in the 70s, that was the, the case in the world. But uh, in the 21st century, it was the case in Bahia, which is a, a great state, uh, a big state in, in, in Brazil. So I, 
I was part of a process that closed the first deal for broadcasting the state championship in, in Bahia and oh, Helmand. 2005, 2006. Okay. I think 2006. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, and I, from Bahia, came back to Rio and worked with Flamengo for a couple of years. Uh, I was uh, an advisor to the president of the club in charge of the strategic uh, initiatives. So the negotiation with TV, with sponsors, even with some players. I was responsible for bringing back Petkovic, which was instrumental for Flamengo to win the championship, the Brazilian national championship in 2009. A great player and a great person as well. Uh, so after working in Flamengo, I went to work as a lawyer, a sports consultant, and then worked for the United Nations in matters related to the World Cup 2014. Uh, established my law firm and, and worked with many, many companies and, and projects related to sports. Uh, and I mean, have been working with that ever since. That's what keeps me off the streets, John. <laughs> Good, Peter. Um, you, you mentioned, of course, you, that uh, you worked for Flamengo. People who know you know that you're a um, Fluminense supporter, uh, very involved in things of, of the club as well, was candidates to, to be presidents for, um, for some time in one of the past uh, elections. So you're involved or have been involved uh, sort of politically there as well. But um, you're actually very much known for uh, that ca capacity that you have of dealing with uh, many stakeholders and being respected and, and, and being welcomed by Flamengo. Um, I went with you once uh, at a lunch with uh, Vasco da Gama president and you're involved with, uh, with Fluminense. How is uh, that uh, that you do? To, to, to relate so well with um, so many sort of different stakeholders, including big rivals. It's a professional relationship to begin with. I, I, I work in this field and, and some, in some cases, in some, some initiatives, I work with a given club, some other initiatives with another club, sometimes for the club, another times against the club. So we, we get to know people and, and it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, when, you, when you move uh, forward in your career, uh, you, 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 you build a, a network of relationships because people, they, they interact with you and, they, and they, uh, they might like you or dislike you, but they, they already know you. Uh, and then, um, I mean, that's a, uh, capital that you you accumulate along uh, your your career i have i have worked with uh, the major clubs and, and the major sports organizations in brazil over the last 20 years i think i think the 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 reason why i i know these people is because i'm getting old and i work with that every day so i meet someone new every day John. And, and, and Pedro, what sort of do you do sort of the most? Because we who follow you see that you're involved in, in many things. It, it seems like uh, Pedro is always participating in, in, in the action of many things that are happening. And normally, not just as an observer, as, as an instrumental part of, of things. Uh, I've been following you. I participated a little in, in, in a few of those things, but you do so much more. Um, how, t tell us about uh, sort of your work. Is, uh, how much you dedicate to, to law? Um, how much you, you, you dedicate to other more strategic business? How is your career at the moment? And where, and where do you see it taking? Where do you want to take it? Well, I'm sure you all can read behind me. The important is not stop questioning. What can you do more? How can you do better? How can you move forward? 
how how can you be useful to other people because it all it all comes to that being useful how can you be useful how can you be instrumental how can you help and once you have found what you can do you have found your place at the table uh, and, and and i think in my case what i do if you if, if you take a look at my law firm we we have uh, litigation we have uh, uh, clients for uh, uh, like uh, entrepreneurs that they want to set up their business, we help them with all the legal structure. But we also have a large number of contracts uh, of, uh, of people hiring as a trusted advisor. What they what they are hiring actually is the interaction with us on a regular basis in a way that we can sit at the board meetings, at the councils, and we can help them with the strategic thinking of their organizations. And why is that? Because as we have interacted with the industry uh, over the last 20 years in, in several different positions, we, we have developed the ability to, to understand different points of view and to identify uh, opportunities and challenges and risks and also to connect the dots because uh, we have been around, so we, we, we might be able to connect some important dots. And these organizations, they recognize that and they hire this service as a trusted advisor so that we can, we can help. I think it all comes down to that word, to that, that concept, being helpful. How can you help? What can you do? How can you do better? That's it. Great, Pedro. Just some a few more hellos uh, arriving here uh, to you. So we have uh, Mohammed from Iran, our friend Enrique Pelosi. I don't know if he's in uh, Turin. By the way, Juventus. Well, where? By the way, Enrique, how yes, can then? I help? How can I help Enrique? I want to help. I want <laughs> to help Juventus in Brazil, please. Great stuff. Hajara uh, is watching from the UK. Regina Justo in Brazil says Palmeiras is the best. Don't know about that. Kaushik uh, is uh, in Lausanne. And André Teixeira is watching us from Portugal. So thank you for thank you for watching. <laughs> thank you for watching. And if, if you enjoy, you know what uh, Pedro is saying, just uh, hit that uh, like button as well. So Pedro. So your mission is to to help, as you say. How would you then define that? Because normally you, you say you're a lawyer, you're a consultant, you're an educator, uh, you're an entrepreneur. It's, it's worth saying that you also run the, um, or, or is the coordinator of the FIFA CIS program uh, that is taught by um, FGV in partnership with FGV in Rio de Janeiro. So how do you define yourself? João. Any definition is a limitation. I am what I am, nothing more, nothing less. That's it. And then what I can tell you is being a lawyer is a very solid background to know the proper ways of doing things. How do you structure everything you do? The law is, is a framework, it's the boundary, it's I mean, very important for everybody. By the way, that's something very strong in the FIFA Master and also at the FIFA Executive Program that we, we conduct, we coordinate in Brazil, because we have a module of law for everybody who works in sports, even not being a lawyer, to have a background in law, a legal background, at least uh, an overview, so that you can develop from, 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 from this point. And everybody should have some background uh, in law, because uh, the law, I mean, everybody should be law-abiding citizens, entrepreneurs and business people, I mean, whatever. So being a lawyer, is very helpful. 
And then being a consultant means, well, you need to, you are selling intelligence, which is very difficult because everybody thinks they are intelligent. So they don't need intelligence from others. When you, when you break through this barrier where people recognize that your intelligence can help them, it's a major breakthrough because you are actually able to bring all your background and, and, and experiences and, and, and network uh, and put it to, to a good use to help someone in, some, in, in something. So you can be a lawyer, a sport consultant, a professor. What is a professor? Someone that helps people to, to grow, to develop. And, and I mean, it's actually all the same uh, if, you, if you look at it uh, closely. That's my opinion, though. Great. Pedro, so you've been very vocal about uh, two topics lately. I mentioned uh, before that you constantly write, you have articles in the biggest newspapers in Brazil and in some international outlets as well. But um, the question about the legislation about uh, games of chance or, or gambling in Brazil is something that uh, you've been very vocal about. And the other um, is about the the process or, or um, you're in favor of clubs uh, stopping, you know, the changing from being a, a members associations, so association of, of, of members, to become an actual company uh, in Brazil. So, Clube Empresa. And actually, uh, Gabriel Liberati posted the questions uh, even before we started, asking you to tell about the pros and cons of the the clubs structured as a company in Brazil. So talk about these two topics. Why are you so interested and why are they so relevant? And then you can also maybe, when you talk about the, the, the clubs becoming companies and changing their, their format, their type, you can answer to, to Gabriel what are the pros, the pros and cons. How much time do we have, John? Oh, oh, Pedro, we have another 14 minutes, but I would, uh, I would prefer if you did that in a, in a, in a few minutes. Not, don't take all 40 for that. <laughs> yes, because uh, I have studied both topics in depth. And I think we need to schedule several other interviews to exploit all we can say about these two topics, but let's let's focus Give on the, the highlights and, the, and on then the we'll clubs. interviews for, only for that. Let's let's focus on the clubs first. Okay. Why a club should be a company? That's the question we need to answer beforehand. And the reason first, is first, Pedro, just, just so so clarify again to people that uh, they are a company in many countries, but in Brazil it's uh, is a different way that they are governed since we are an international audience. Okay, since we are an international audience, let's look at the international picture. In the United States and in the UK, mostly, clubs were companies from the beginning. Not all clubs, though. If you, if you research at the FA website, you will see a manual that uh, indicates that some clubs should be non-profit organizations, but definitely not the professional clubs. In France, in Spain, in Portugal, just to give a few examples, clubs were non-profit organizations at the beginning. And why was that? Because when sports started to organize itself, it was not a business. Until the 70s, sport was not a business whatsoever. Sport became the business it is nowadays when TV started to broadcast sports and transformed sports in a media outlet with uh, sponsors seeking uh, to I mean, uh, display their brands and, and engage with their audiences. But it was it, it is rather recent. Uh, it's a, a phenomenon, it's a, a rather recent phenomenon. So, once sport became a commercial activity, all these countries I mentioned, France, Portugal, 
Spain, and others. They have passed laws uh, obligating these clubs to transform in companies. They are not allowed to remain non-profits. Even in Germany, where they have a, a, a law saying that the non-profit association should, should withhold 51% of the shares of a company if a club decides to move into this direction. This is not the case. CIS Sports Intelligence Unit has already dismissified that by showing that most of the clubs in Germany have already outsourced football to another company, which is not subject to this limitation. So the club, yes, 51% of the shares, but the football part is outsourced to another company that might or might not be owned by, by the club. And why? Why this club should be managed through these commercial vehicles to companies? Because that's the only way you can bring new investment. Europe is now facing a very interesting situation. Financial fair play is in place also to limit the amount of investment the club owners can make in their clubs. If it was not so, PSG, Manchester City, and other clubs, states nowadays, uh, would have endless resources. And it, would, it wouldn't be a fair competition with the others. Brazil is on the other opposite end of this situation. We have no investment whatsoever. While Europe is fighting to limit, to limitate the investment, Brazil has no investment. And why is that? Because Brazil is the only country among the 10 biggest world markets that do not have a professional league running the championship and do not have companies uh, as clubs. You so, have Brazilians investing elsewhere. Oh, <laughs> yes. Ronaldo investing in Valladolid, in Spain, in Portugal, more than two Brazilians owning clubs there, uh, a Brazilian owning a club at MLS. So it's, 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 it's a nonsense uh, uh, to, to, to remain still uh, in time and not change these structures. Brazilian law should, should state that professional clubs should be companies, and that's it. The, the, the role of the state is to regulate the markets, even to, to correct market flaws. And it is a market flaw in Brazil, as it was in Spain, as it was in Portugal, as it was in France, as it was in Italy. So we should learn from others and, and move forward quickly. And, and an argument that you normally uh, use as well is uh, about uh, the tax pain as well which is the clubs nowadays don't pay tax and maybe that they should. That's a nonsense. Of course they should. It is a commercial activity and everybody should pay uh, taxes. And by the way, if someone doesn't pay, those paying are paying more. So the society as a whole, why should we bear this cost? Why should we bear uh, this exemption for these clubs. There is no reason. And another thing which is important to state, the European Union has faced uh, this question about taxation when some clubs questioned the taxation of Barcelona and Real Madrid in Spain, saying that if those clubs had less taxes, it would be an unfair advantage com in comparison with the other clubs. And the result of this, of this process was the conclusion that Barcelona and Real Madrid, they pay the same taxes the other clubs pay. Not the same, the same uh, tax, specific taxes, but the same amount of taxes at the end of the day. Uh, which brings us to a, a very interesting question, because in Brazil, some people, they keep trying to, to hold to this non-profit model, saying that Barcelona and Real Madrid are exceptions to this model. Yes, so we do not. I don't think we should look at the exception. We should look at the rule. But if we are looking at, at the exception, which is the rule in Brazil, they, they pay taxes. 
So let's just keep this in mind. If you want to look at Spain, no problem, but let's tax everybody the same in Brazil. Then I think clubs that uh, can organize themselves as companies, they would do it. Right now they cannot do it because they will have a, a more taxes to pay and less money to invest in their teams. It would be an unfair uh, advantage in the competition. So we need to move forward from that. Yes, Yuri, that Bubragantino will grow a lot, has already grown a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a good example. Do you, do you think a, an occasional success of uh, Red Bull Bragantino could actually stimulate that process? Or like, if they fail, it, um, it serves as an excuse that the, that, module, that model is not the best. And if they well, actually... Because some, in, in football, we're very driven by results, right? You win, you're a genius. If you lose, you're... you're maybe, more. maybe what Red Bull Bragantino can, can, can serve as an example for other investors, that it's possible to find a way to invest in Brazilian football. But not for the Brazilian clubs, because the people managing these clubs, they are amateurs. And they know very well they wouldn't have a place in a professional environment. So I don't think they want to change anything. And, and, and what about the discussion about uh, gaming or games of chance or gambling, as we call in, in Brazil? Well, it started for me when I looked at sports betting growing every day in Brazil without any regulation and this is a threat to sports integrity. Uh, there is no, no other way to protect sports integrity than to regulate properly and monitor uh, sports betting. And we need to, to face it. And something that I have been, been defending in sports is, look at the World Cup in Russia. The amount of money in bets during the World Cup in Russia was far more than what FIFA made with the World Cup. We are talking about more than 200 billion euros in sports uh, bets in World Cup matches. And FIFA, if you, if you add up all the revenues uh, from the World Cup, we are talking about around 6 billion euros. So that is a huge amount of money going on in sports betting and, 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 and sports is only at risk. It hasn't any uh, benefit whatsoever from, from it. And it's somehow like TV at the beginning when TV was saying, oh, we are helping you to get exposure. We don't need to pay for, for broadcasting your, your matches. We have already overcome this discussion and TV now pays to broadcast. Sports betting is using sports content without paying anything for it. It must change. Eventually, sports betting might be the most engaging way to interact with sports fans. And by the way, when, when someone is betting in a sports event, it is playing along. It's a whole different experience. The adrenaline is... Uh, when you are about to win or to lose your money, it's something that changes the experience you have with sports. And sports should be aware of that. Why not thinking of sports organizations having their own sports books and seizing this money for sports to help preventing uh, any threat of sports integrity, but also helping financing properly the growth of sports. I have wrote, I have written with, together with Nick Lau, another good friend of ours, uh, a paper where we, where we suggest that FIFA should have their own sports books. So let's offer a proper experience to sports fans and not just leave them at large for uh, websites to use sports content without paying anything for it. That's the future, wrong. Everybody should look at it. 
Thank you, Pedro. There's some comments uh, here coming also from Eduardo Ramos. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. I want to, before um, go back to that discussion of uh, we're talk his comment is about clubs becoming companies. Let, let me ask you about um, education, Pedro. You're very much involved in education. You're, you're running, uh, you're the coordinator of the FIFA course at uh, FGV and you did a master's in, in sport as well. For you, what would you say, for people that are watching that may be considering uh, taking that step, what do you say the, the importance of, um, say, taking a, a master's in sport and maybe and how did that help you effectively? You were already working in sport before, you were with a, with a federation, you went and did the master's. How useful was that for you? Oh, as I said, it's, it's, it's still useful. I, we need to think before we speak. We need to be prepared before we do anything. So going to school is getting preparation, is getting ready to seize the opportunities and to make the most out of them, to be the most uh, helpful you can be to, to society. So going to... Uh, a FIFA master degree or the course we, we offer in Brazil, we have already uh, more than 600 graduate, graduated in, in the course we offer in Brazil. And I can tell you, we are changing the Brazilian sports industry little by little. It's an ongoing process, but we are changing. When we, when we get all these people with the same solid background, thinking about sports and how it can evolve, well, we are, we are making progress here. So I think everybody that wants to work with anything should study, should study first. You need to study first. Before you do anything, you need to think. And the best place to think is at school, university. And uh, also in, uh, I work in sports lives. <laughs> good, very yeah, good. I, I would add, as well is that um, at least for us the the experience of, of doing a master's as we did in the fifth master is that you pay for a year and you actually profit from the rest of your life right so we've been uh, connected and enjoying the the teachings of, of the masters from our from our group of friends since we graduated I I, I think I can tell uh, I have been involved with the alumni association from the very beginning. It was created in the year I was there and here we need to pay tribute to John Siner and, and uh, all others that were the founding members of the, of the alumni association to say that it's an ongoing, it's a, a continuing education program because every year or every two years uh, we have been organizing meaningful gatherings with seminars where we can learn from, 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 from each other and from other experiences as well. I, I remember the seminar we organized in the World Cup in Brazil in 2014. You were there, you were the locomotive of the, of the seminar, you made it happen. And also the one we organized in, in Russia, in Moscow, in the last World Cup. And I can, I can, I can, I can be proud of what we did, but I, I can tell we learned from, from, from the experiences we, we put on the stage and also from the interaction with, with each other. So we have all these people coming, coming from all over the world and sharing contacts, sharing experiences, sharing perspectives, and, and, and that's something that our FIFA master does and, and keeps us together and keeps us up to date. Thank you for doing that, João. I think your statement that we invest one year in profit our whole life is most accurate. It's yeah, very good. You, you mentioned, I'm going to deviate here just uh, one second because you mentioned the events that uh, we did in, in Brazil during the, the World Cup. Um, so, for whoever doesn't know, during the World Cup, so Pedro I was already in Brazil, was a big proponent of a, a big event uh, there. And I was contributing with the Alumni Association, we elected member there. 
and we brought this idea, idea forward. And basically, both of us did that event. It was awesome for about 400 people. We had every everyone from the industry there. The president was there. There was ministers, there were athletes, Cafu, Bebeto, many others. Um, it was it was a great event, and for me, I think was the thing that uh, really showed me that it was possible to create something like I work in sport. The the event, I think, without that experience of uh, practic practically just a sort of two people putting together an event of that size and making that happen, that actually was what gave me confidence. I don't think I ever told you that. I mentioned that in other talks I gave uh, in interviews, but uh, thanks for that, Pedro. Uh, that was, uh, well, that's one of the, the great things about um, about that, about uh, having a network of, uh, of friends and, and, I mean, doing things uh, together. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back to, to the question, or just a comment actually, so we don't, we don't miss it. Um, before I go to another topic, about Eduardo Ramos, he's uh, on LinkedIn watching us. Basically, that's a comment that you might want to talk about. It's one of the main sources of income in the middle of small size club in Brazil. Why they want to be association members is that they can ask, I guess, money based in a law, a Brazilian law that allows companies to pay non-profits organizations um, uh, discounting what was that sorry I got a, a different paying uh, just half of the annual taxes I don't know if he's talking about the agency or yeah, uh, look he, he, he is right uh, because if you if you if you look at the operation of a football club as some something that is based on donations, on tax incentives, and all these sort of things that non-profit organizations use, you are completely right. If this is your source of revenue, maybe you are not a commercial entity, but if you are looking at professional football, you must look. You must look at a, a, a commercial entity. And, and, and bring in investment from the private sector, as it is happening all over the world. I have given a, a presentation in a seminar last week, and I had to study international investment in football clubs all over the world. In, in England, for instance, if you, if you take the four divisions, more than half of the clubs belong to international investors. In Portugal, more than 12 clubs in the first and second division belong to international investors. Uh, in France as well, in, in, in Spain as well, in Italy as well. In Uruguay, Manchester City just bought a club in, in, in Uruguay. So Brazil is the only one uh, not receiving international investment. If you look at this uh, activity as a commercial and professional one, you need to be commercial and professional. If you are looking at the activity as something that really is like uh, ludic or uh, something that is uh, relying on tax incentives and, and, and donations. Maybe you are not a professional and commercial entity and then you don't need to be a, a company. He, he, I think he placed another question about Red Bull. Yeah. I want to answer that. He basically said that uh, yeah, put it Red Bull, the original plan actually has uh, failed, right? Because they I spent. Can you, I, can tell you, I can tell you that if you were right in your first point, you are wrong in the second one. Because uh, for Red Bull, it is a success. They are not looking at profits from, from, the, from the operation in Brazil. They are using the marketing budget instead of sponsoring a club. They, they are buying a club. And each, actually, if, if some companies uh, looked at it in the same way, they would be rather buying clubs than just sponsoring uh, because it might be cheaper to get the exposure they get by managing the whole club than just placing the brand in some shirts. So, I mean, you need to make the account, but you need to do the math. Uh, 
but it's it, for Red Bull, it's a, it, it is a success. And that's another thing that I should mention. If you look at clubs around the world, you don't see many distributing profits. They do not, the, the owners, they don't get money from the club. They get the equity, like Abramovich, for instance. Abramovich bought Chelsea for 140 million pounds, and today Chelsea is valued at 3 billion pounds. Abramovich did not take any money from the operation of the club over no the dividends. years. No, no dividends. Uh, on the contrary, on the first year, on top of the 140 million pounds, he invested in buying the club. He invested 150 million pounds more to buy some players and the following years 150 million more to buy more players and then i think the club went on uh, itself uh, with their own revenues but the thing is he was not looking at a, a dividend uh, company i mean it's not for, and and it's the same case with most of the of the investors in in, in football they are rich from other activities. There is even a, a, a saying, the fastest way to become a millionaire is being a billionaire and buying a football club. So that's the fastest way to become a millionaire uh, because you actually spend money in, in, in football clubs. But these rich people, they have their own toys. Some of them, they, they buy Ferraris, some of them buy planes, some of them buy boats, and some of them buy football clubs. And their money is is is, is welcome because it it <laughs> fuels in the 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 engrenage of the of the football industry and pays us all that work in in sports. Pedro, there's a few sort of more comments from friends of I work in sport and our friends here. So Patrick Castro in Lausanne says hi. Have, have, you, have you have you have you already paid Patrick Castro? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Patrick, you see, I was looking uh, after you. Yash, Yash, Yash is a great guy. By the way, uh, I something that I really like is this mentorship program at the FIFA Master. Uh, I, I always volunteer to be a mentor. One of the... One of the people I mentored is now working with me at, at my law firm. It's my partner at the law firm, Jose Cândido. It's a great, great honor and pleasure to have you here. Yash, I could meet him in Milan. I think it's something that gives us uh, the opportunity to learn from them, but also to share in a, in a more intimate relationship, a more close relationship, uh, our experience as well. For sure. And I not only paid uh, Patrick, but if you saw a few videos ago, a few weeks ago, even grew a mustache to also promote uh, one of his uh, campaigns. So, yeah, but this is, this is a tradition, it's a Movember. <laughs> we're together. And, um, and Amo uh, Yang, sorry if I say that wrong, he says, he reminds that uh, the City Group invested even in India. When you're well, they have 11, more than 11 clubs around the world, but not only not only them. Uh, I recommend everybody look at CIS Intelligence Sports Unit because they have been doing a great job in gathering this information and it, it shows clearly the globalization of the investment in football clubs. And how come Brazil, being the largest exporter of football players, not is not receiving any, any any investment. I mean, who will invest in a non-profit organization? Well, the, the, the yeah, answer is good. Fernando Reutemann as well, a good friend of ours. Pedro, there, there are many people that watch us either here um, or, or later uh, on demand, uh, delayed, and they are interested in opportunities in sport. So some of them just finished a, a master's or they're doing a master's or without uh, even doing a master's per se, they're looking for opportunities in sport. If you were to give some advice, where are the opportunities uh, in sport at the moment? Well, in your heart and in your mind, because if you, if you can think you can do, and you don't need to have a job 
to, to do something meaningful. You just need to do it. Have a look at my Kuju, for instance, someone from the master that created a, a business model which is successful and meaningful for sports all over the world. Have a look at what you are doing, João. You have, you have been an entrepreneur uh, with your own business and I think everybody uh, can do that uh, if they're, they have the will. I mean, uh, if there is a will, there is a way. So you, you need to find what is your will and then you will find your way. Not just send your CVs around and look for a job because that's just something you can do. You can do much more if you if you want. Yeah, I think you're, you're an example of, in some of my lectures, one I actually was invited um, by you to give at uh, the F FGP with Jules Lavella. One of the topics there, I explained where opportunities may be, but I think the last one was create your own job as well. And Julio, Julio is an example for that. I think uh, if you have a chance to interview him, because he he actually planned how he would get uh, to where he is right now, and, and even being a job given by, by others in an organization, he was entrepreneur to get that job. He had a, a, a career plan, and I think I think everybody should 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 have it because if you don't know where you are going, uh, you can go anyway because anyway <laughs> will be good for you. You are not going anywhere, so you need to have a goal. You need to have a target. You need to have, I mean, uh, something to to fight for. And now we are fighting for likes, as you have put on our screen. <laughs> oh, Pedro and, and and everyone, we're we're. Uh, going to the end of the, the, the interview now, there's a, a couple more questions. Um, if you want to ask a question, now is the time. Don't be shy. We have one here uh, from Yuri. Dominguez in Brazil. So do you believe that bats will work at Sunday's game? Subscription and give a share to the box. I see no reason why other companies can use the content we create in sports better than us. The, the, the way forward for sports is engaging with the audience. That's the model of the internet. It's a different model than TV that was just giving you brand exposure. Right now, you need to, you need the tool, you have the tools to engage directly with your audience. And sports betting and even being a fantasy game is an engaging tool. I think every sports organization should organize uh, their own uh, engaging tools with fantasy games, sports betting, and many, many other things. So I, I believe that's the future. Otherwise, we will just watch other companies using the content of sports organizations for free, making tons of money, and we will just watch the current business model we have in place fading away. Because if you, if you look at the investment in advertisement, uh, it's already bigger on the internet than on TV. This is a trend. And are you, are you really seeing any internet players, uh, stakeholders buying uh, sports rights? Very few and the business model is completely different. You either engage directly with your audience online or you have no business online whatsoever. And the most engaging tool online for sports nowadays is sports betting. Just look at the numbers. Follow the money. Pedro, so looking back at your career, professionally, what was uh, your biggest challenge? And what would you say is your biggest achievement so far? Uh, João, when we look in, 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 in retrospect, now, when we look back, uh, if, we, if we succeeded the challenge, we were up to the task. So I think the biggest challenge is just ahead of us. It's, it's 
uh, helping Brazilian clubs to become companies to enter into, 20, to, into the 21st century, to bring international investment to Brazil, to integrate Brazilians uh, into the world of, 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 of sports and beginning with football club, becoming companies and, and international companies, uh, so to say. I think that's the biggest challenge uh, I have uh, in front of me now nowadays. And what was the other question? No, I, I, I asked you what, what would you say was your favorite uh, achievement or what's the biggest challenge that you had in your career? But I can, if you don't want to add, talk about your biggest achievement so far, maybe do you have a favorite uh, failure? Something that didn't work out but was an important lesson for you? No, oh, I, 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 have, I have a special care with the course at FGV, I think that's where we can really share all the knowledge, all the experience and all, all the network that we, we have built with other people that will multiply this uh, impact into the sports industry. So I, I think the, the, one of the biggest achievements is being part of an academic program that help other people to, to, to grow and, and other people to to impact sports industry as a whole. So I would say the course is my most cherished uh, uh, activity, uh, but it's far from being the most profitable. If we look at the, at the numbers, uh, I would say there were more profitable uh, initiatives. And if you say, uh, I mean, look at the events. I was part of the World Youth Day when the Pope visited Brazil, which was biggest than, bigger than the World Cup and the, and the Olympic Games. It was the, the biggest event Brazil had in the last uh, years. I was somehow part of the World Cup and, and the Olympic Games, and uh, both events were amazing for, for Brazil and for, for everybody working in sports in, in, in Brazil. I was part of the public viewing events during the, the, the World Cup and even the Confederations Cup. We organized public viewing events for the Confederations Cup, which was not usual uh, in, for FIFA, but we did in Brazil. And I was uh, part of the, of the team that made it, it, it happen. There was also something that I, I really like to, to to say, it. I'm really proud to, to having been part, which was uh, an initiative uh, of UMBEV, which started to, to foster the membership program, membership programs of the clubs in Brazil. When we started with that initiative at UMBEV, uh, all the clubs in Brazil together had 150,000 members socios torcedores uh, and because of this program Brazil has now more than 1.5 million members in these clubs nowadays and, and it's something that really already made a difference but could make a huge difference because it is in the right direction of engaging directly with the fan base and, and monetizing that so I'm, I'm extremely uh, proud and happy of having been part of it, and with Ambev as well, uh, of being part of uh, an, an initiative that organized more than 700 public viewing events in Brazil during the World Cup in very small cities. So we, we really made the World Cup for available and accessible for uh, much, much more people than just those in the stadium and the official uh, fan zones. I and think and about things that didn't work out, uh, a favorite uh, failure, something that uh, was a lesson for you. Is that something that's... Uh... Well, they, they, uh, uh, they didn't work out yet. I'm still working on them. Okay, so keep trying. Yes, always. <laughs> By the way, uh, there is a book that I, gave, I have given you, The Drunkard's Walk. I think everybody should read because in essence, the difference between the distance between success and failure is the amount of times you try. Because if you keep trying, 
even a, a stopped watch will be right two times a day. So it's just a matter of looking at it at the right time, at the right moment, at the right place. And if you keep trying, one day you'll be at the right time, at the right moment, at the right place, and everything will work out fine. Good, good. Pedro, what's your favorite? Uh, we're, we're closing. Uh, we're ending. We just hit the one hour mark. So very quickly, do you have a favorite sporting moment? You, you've been to many or sports events, or maybe Matt's uh, sports hero, yours? You know, <laughs> there are so many, but one of them was with you and, and Nick, <coughs> and, and thanks to our friend Julio, in St. Petersburg, when we went to that football match with all the people we went together with. It was really amazing. Thank you, Julio, once more. And <laughs> Very, very good being there with you and, and, and Nick, my, my best friend from the Marshall as well. And, and I think it's, uh, it's been very, very good to, to, to be with you in, in all these events we have been together. And I'm looking forward to the next one. Please, COVID, go away. Yeah, please go away. So last, last two things. I was actually going to ask you to, to, to recommend a book. Actually... Amo Jane again. Sorry if I got uh, your 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 name wrong. Asking what's the what the book's uh, name. I'm gonna type it here um, while I'm gonna ask Pedro to say uh, maybe uh, suggest another one. The drunk. Well, that's the drunkard's walk by Leonard Leonard Mlodinov. It it is actually the the book that I recommend the most. I think it's one of my my favorite books of all time. Um, so I'm going to write that in the comments. Amo, uh, Nick Lau is also saying excellent uh, memory from St. Petersburg. It's great to see that Nick is watching us. I, I love you, Nick. <laughs> you a lot. And any, any other book that, uh, that you'd like to recommend since uh, you just gave a great uh, option? Anything else? Or, or do, do you listen to podcasts, Pedro? Or, when I have time, João, I, 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 I must tell you, uh, I wish I had more time to listen to podcasts and doing other, other things as well. Okay, I was, I'm, I'm going to write uh, the, the, the name of the book in the comments um, right after that. So, Pedro, we, as I said, we just passed the, the hour. It's been great. Ah, I cannot... Um, let, let you go after mentioning it. Maybe let's just share a story because it's a, it's a great one. Oh, Pedro Correa is with us as well. Pedro Correa. We love you too, Pedro. You have already paid Pedro as well, right? <laughs> I did, I did, yes. Um, many, well, j just to clarify, is that I, I didn't pay him to come and say hi to you and to give a like in the video. Pedro is just mentioning uh, a job that's a very, nice, a very nice project that we have put uh, together and couldn't make it because of this COVID. We were working together in a, a training program for presidents of Brazilian football clubs of Sao Paulo with the Football Federation of Sao Paulo and uh, Pedro Correia, Patrick Castor, Nick Lau and many others that are together with us, not only for this project, but together with us for the whole life, because we have been doing things together and we will do so many more in the future. So we were all part of this of this project and the company leading this was João Frigerio's company. He was the responsible for making it happen and he was the responsible for paying everybody. That's why I'm asking. Pedro, before, before, before we go, I think you're the only person I know that I have met the last three popes. How did you do that? Well, I, people I don't know that you're a very religious person involved with yeah, yeah. Church in Rio. But you well, have I, with all I, of them. I am Catholic and I, I go to church, I pray, and I... I, I met the last three popes, and it was, I mean, amazing. 
Pope John Paul II, which I mean, he's a, a saint nowadays. I met when I was at the master. Uh, it was funny though because uh, I Tell received the story. The, oh, I received the call. Uh, <laughs> I was in class, and when I, I looked at the call, it was from the Brazilian embassy, and I had to take it. So I was sitting at the back of the class, and I took the call, uh, to, to, trying to to dodge for I mean. Hiding from the teacher, and uh, the embassy said, "Well, uh, your audience with the Pope was granted. You need to be here in in, in the Vatican tomorrow." And it was, I mean, I was in Milan in the afternoon. I had to leave straight away to try, I mean, and to get to Rome. Uh, so I, I I took the call and I I, I took my things and I, I left the room, the classroom, and the professor there was like outraged, like, "How can you do that?" I mean, ah. So you take the call and now you leave. And, and I said, no, oh, sorry, I, I have an audience with the Pope. And then I left. And, and I think he, he did not believe when I, when I said that to him. And, and he complained with the class. Oh, this guy, he does not respect. He's respectful. Yeah. So, but then I left. Uh, and I, I went to Rome. I had the audience with the Pope. And, mm -hmm. and then when he learned it was true, he apologized and he was really happy that uh, one of the students uh, could meet with the Pope in that, at that moment, because John Paul II was not receiving so many people. He was already ill. Uh, actually, he died uh, in the following uh, year. Uh, so it was a, a remarkable moment. It's one of the most touching moments of my of my life. And also with Francisco, the first time I met with Pope Francis, it was at the beginning of his pontificate, and uh, he took my hands and, and, and said, pray for me, please. So can you can you imagine, I mean, the Pope asking you to pray for him? It's, uh, it's something that, I mean, you are there to ask for, for blessings or, I mean, uh, he should pray for you at the most common sense uh, idea, but instead he humbly was asking people to pray for him and it was very, very touching. I cried in both times. Uh, so uh, thank you for bringing up these memories because it made my day, João. Well. Thank you. Oh, wow. Pedro, you have uh, many stories to tell. Too, too, too bad that uh, we already passed, um, passed the time. Before we go, is there any last message that you want to leave to people that are still um, watching us? Stay safe, be well. If you need a lawyer, please call me. Okay, if we need a lawyer, we call Pedro. I want to thank everyone that uh, participated and uh, left their uh, messages. Oh, just before we go, Yuri Dominguez is mentioning that he's uh, reading Moneyball. Um, and that's there's a, a chapter ah there is another 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 book i would like to mention uh it is called the club and it tells the story of the premier league how it was formed it's a very 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 good book and for brazilians watching there is a translation of this book called a liga in portuguese and it's very interesting because the beginning of the, the book uh, tells how football was organized in England. Uh, and, and if you change England for Brazil, it's the description of how Brazil is, how football, how Brazilian football is nowadays. So if uh, English football could uh, have this turnaround with the Premier League and, and become the um, biggest uh, business in the world, so Brazil has a future as well, because we are so bad as English football was before the Premier League. So let's create the league, transform clubs and companies, and then work a lot to make things happen in the right way in Brazil. That, that's right. So uh, Yuri was just uh, make, making a point that uh, the book tells that uh, clubs at that time didn't really care about data at all. They were offering them and they were just refusing to have it. And now that uh, company is making, of course, a lot of money. It was actually bought by by Fox. And uh, also, Hajara Hussein said there's an obvious shift in the sport development paradigm around the world. 
It's a last question for you, Pedro, if, if you can, uh, before we go. How is it affecting youth athletes from low socioeconomic background in Brazil? Well, in which way? I mean, if, if, if the business thrives, uh, they all have more opportunities. They will have more clubs to, to play. They will have their salaries paid. Because right now in Brazil, the, the clubs, they promise salaries, but they don't pay because they don't have money to pay. So it's not unusual to have football players uh, three months without receiving the salaries, four months without receiving the salaries. And uh, we cannot accept that as a normal thing. So uh, when we have the top of the pyramid already set and really working properly on a commercial basis, we will have also more, more tools to develop the bottom of the pyramid so that more people will have access to sports. Look at, look at England, England, Germany. England has more than 9,000 football clubs. 9,000 football clubs. Germany has thousands of football clubs. Brazil, 700 football clubs registered at CBF. Why? Because we don't have means to develop the bottom of the pyramid and we don't have, we don't have, we don't have also means to develop the top of the pyramid. These, these things are different and they need to be dealt with in a different way. We can, you cannot compare a non-profit organization from the bottom of the pyramid to the club making one billion reais per year. Yeah, they are different animals. Okay. And with that, we're going to end. I want to thank everyone that's uh, left their message. Again, if you're still here with us until now, don't forget that to hit the like button. If you liked that interview, want to see more of that and be reminded, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and uh, we'll be uh, with you again soon. Pedro, thank you so much uh, for doing this. It's a pleasure, as always, to have the time to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you soon. Hopefully in Brazil, if I, if I make it uh, to the holidays. Okay, João. Take care. Thank you for everything. Cheers.